Hi, I'm Iris Johnston and welcome to Page to Screen where we explore the art and craft of screenwriting and independent filmmaking. This time we're going to explore a topic that a lot of our members keep asking about writing for animation. And joining us is our very special guest and a pioneer in the animation and home video industries, Mike Naraki. Welcome, Mike. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Iris. Thanks for having me. It's so Absolutely. great to be here. Absolutely. Good. Great. So you've had some amazing success, Mike, and we want to get into all that you have going on. But first, let's jump inside a DeLorean and take a little trip back in time to get a little backstory on Mike Naraki. Are you from Nashville? Um, well, I kind of feel like I am now. I've been here for about 20 years. I like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I very much consider Nashville my home now. But uh, I was a, an Air Force kid. So I grew up all over the country and uh, okay. in Japan for uh, four years as well. So um, Southern California, Colorado, Washington, D.C. So jumped, jumped around a lot. Went to school in Chicago. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, just a little, you know, background growing up, I loved... Uh, to make people laugh. I was sort of the class clown, um, you know, mm -hmm. family clown, so mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. I got into theater at a young age and performing, mm -hmm. um, and uh, mm. for me, that turned into a love of, um, of uh, puppetry, actually. I was a huge Jim Henson fan. And just loved the Muppets. Uh, loved this Jim is Henson. when you were little. This is when Even I was little, like middle school, high okay. schoolish. School, so I started school. messing around with that. I, you know, I did a lot of theater as well. But then I discovered that I loved kind of being. Uh, I loved entertaining people without being seen because okay. I was sort of a tall, kind of gangly, awkward kid, you uh -huh. know. So and I, I loved to make people laugh, but I didn't necessarily love being on stage. Stage, okay. Yeah, yeah. So and puppets so, could. Yeah, pu puppets could kind of put a, a barrier between me and, and yeah. the audience, you know. So um, yeah. so I, I, I like that. And uh, so, but and I also, you know, loved music. Um, uh, was a big fan of parody music as well. Dr. Demento uh, Radio Hour. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, you know, I'm a little bit older than you. But <laughs> Sunday know. night, Dr. Demento. So <laughs> radio out show Weird Al Yankovic. It's where Weird Al okay, Yankovic that got his I start. Got. Yeah, okay, yeah. I got that. So one. I was a huge fan of that, and so so those are the kind of the early influences on me that I just I just mm -hmm. loved that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I had no idea that would end up being a career for me, but that's just you know, I'd grown up loving that. When you graduated high school, did you know right away that I'm going to go after that? Had no idea. So my, uh, I came from kind of a STEM family. You know, my dad was an engineer. My mom was a nurse. My oh, older yeah. brother, when I graduated high school, was a chemistry major in college. And so, you know, I, I, I went to college to do pre-med. So, and I, and I actually, I finished, I, I double majored in biology and history. <sighs> And along the way, you know, sort of as hobbies, sort of started mm -hmm. to follow these other pursuits. Um, actually met Phil Vischer, who would become uh, the voice of Bob the Tomato in college. Uh, so actually doing puppets together. So so, the, okay, so tell me the whole story of how you met yeah. and just the details around that. I went to, uh, ended up my first year, in, year and a half in college, I went to a very small college called Crown College up in Minneapolis. It was a, it was a college associated with the denomination that I grew up in. And uh, uh, so I, I met Phil at this college. He wanted to be a filmmaker. I was on my way to, you know, doing pre-med. They didn't have either of those programs at this school. Mm -hmm. So both of us only intended to go there for a couple of years. But we just had a lot of fun writing and performing. And we like to say traveling around the Minnesota countryside, scaring the Baptists with our, <laughs> with our puppets. And so, um, so we just developed a good friendship, a good collaboration. Uh, and then um, Phil got an internship and then he got offered a job at a video post-production house. So okay. he took that job. Uh, we, roomed, we were roomed together. Um, I was working to get residency in Illinois, and a job opened up where Phil was working as a graveyard shift VHS tape duplicator. And so <laughs> it's a great student job. <laughs> so, so I took that job and just started, uh, you know, duplicating VHS tapes at night um, on T120s, which were like, you know, two-hour videotapes. So while the, the, the reels were running, it would give me the opportunity to start messing around and learning the equipment. So I, I was learning editing, I was learning ah. sound and video. So learning production, and every once in a while I'd get asked to go out on a shoot, and mm -hmm. you know, so I was getting production experience, um, as was Phil. And this was in the really early years of when computers were starting to kind of make their way into production. And so, just so I'm clear, you're still taking classes in pre-med? 
this yeah, time. yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing. I, I double majored in biology and history, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go to medical school. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> but this do is fun. This I love this. I'm this just side. kind of on the yeah. side. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but um, just learning uh, production along the way, and computer animation was just starting to emerge at this time. This was mm -hmm. in the mid '80s, uh, late '80s, actually, and. Um, uh, you know, nonlinear editing was just kind of coming out, um, and we were sort of we were the young guys at the at the studio, so mm -hmm. we, we were more computer literate than a lot of the folks that had been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we got a, you know some early opportunities to to you know start getting to know this equipment, and John Lasseter. Um, uh, was doing some work uh, in early stages. This was pre Toy Story, which was the very first computer animated Pixar movie. Okay. So he was doing some short films that were really intriguing to us because we were learning that same kind of equipment. But you know, he was. We were flying logos around, you know, shiny logos around uh -huh. at this post production house. But John Lasseter was using these w this anime this this technology to make characters, and we were just really intrigued by that. And so we thought, wow. If we can, you know, create uh, characters with no hair, no limbs, and no clothes, you know, vegetables, you know, which is what they turn out to be, <laughs> yeah. we might be able to tell a show and kind of do what we did back when we puppeted, you know, mm -hmm. just sort of, we were writing a lot of just fun mm -hmm. sketch comedies, um, you know, with puppets, and, you know, maybe we could do that with, with vegetables as well. Well, you are probably most recognized as the co-creator of Veggie Tales, and the concept for it, obviously the puppets had something to do and the restrictions of the format you were, you know, learning. Right. Ma but vegetables, like, a, do you have a story behind, like, the coming up with the concept? Why vegetables? Yeah. Well, you know, so yeah, driven by the need for simple characters. Actually, Phil had had the concept with for candy bars at first, um, and so <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, kids love candy, but but he, you kind know, of more than <laughs> yeah, vegetables. I know, right? More than vegetables. <laughs> but his wife, so he, Phil got married many years before I did, but his wife, uh, Phil had had modeled a candy bar, stuck, you know, what are now the Veggie Tales eyes on this candy. Bar. <laughs> <laughs> and we start. And his wife walked by, and she said, "Phil, moms are not going to like this. No, no. <laughs> they are not going to like this." Yeah. So, so it was the wisdom of a mother. And it's like, well, the next idea was, well, what, what, what about vegetables? They're healthy, and so right. that, that's the veggie, veggies were born. And so, um, Mr. Cucumber came first. So, um, yeah, it, who would yes. later become known as Larry, oh. but uh, um, uh, and then after that, Bob. Uh, so, um, yeah. So just uh, we did in, in the early years, we did a, a little screen test before we raised money for our first episode okay. uh, called Take 38 where we brought Bob and Larry to life and voiced them and sort of lent our own you know, we had done puppets, so we voiced our characters. I was going to well. ask you. So yeah. you are the voice. I am the voice of Larry the Cucumber. So okay. If you, Larry the Cucumber. <laughs> if I can do that, there you go. There's Larry. Right we there. insist. Yes. <laughs> so, For the rest of the yes, whole yeah, episode. Yes. If you know the character, you'll get the voice. If not, it's just a blank expression. <laughs> that love of performing and acting, you know, it made its way in, and so that's for both both of us. We were, you know, <laughs> we were we were writers. We were performers who kind of learned how to do animation. You know, so yeah. that's kind of where. And if you watch the first. You know, few episodes of Veggie Tales. The animation is really rough. It looks like guys who don't exactly. really know how to animate. Yeah, yeah. How but at the time, it was so it was so not computer animation was so novel. We could get away with it because there were a lot of people that were doing it. How many series or years or you know did it go? Well, so it's you know this is the, actually 1993 was the first year uh, was the ep our first episode, episode. and so okay. 30 years now. So there hasn't been a new Veggie Tales production in probably four years or so. Okay, so. Um, that's yeah, so new, 30, 30 years. So, and I was with I was with Veggie Tales from 30, 93 up to 2016. So, um, we did oh, well. We did two feature films and probably 50 or 60 uh, direct to videos. So, how did you get the first episode made? I'm not sure if you've already answered this question. Kind yeah. of, we've gone around it a little bit. A little bit, yeah. But you needed money. Uh, yeah, we needed a little bit of money. Okay. Um, yeah, and so uh, Phil actually went out and uh, so the pitch was. Okay, we've got these vegetables, um, computer animated, that are going to tell Bible stories. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's an easy that, that, pitch. that was the easy, easy pitch. pitch. People were just like busting down the doors to give us money, and they, they weren't. <laughs> and so, um, but the Bible uh, and vegetables. Uh, Bibles and vegetables, two great tastes. <laughs> and so, um, uh, but uh, we we were able to raise about sixty thousand dollars for our very first episode. And so, um, you know, with that, bought the first uh, workstation to to animate the show on. And so. And and then hired two uh, kids right out of art school to help animate on, on, okay. on, on shifts. So we had, you know, the day shift, the night shift, and the graveyard shift. So going around on the same computer. Um, was it fun? Was it fun? 
It was a lot, a lot of work. Of fun. Yeah, a it work, was a, well. We were, we were, yeah. Well, we were very young. We it was, young. it was a lot of fun until the very end when we didn't sleep for three weeks, and then it just got and to be, got yeah, that. yeah, it got bad. So my so. last question regarding Veggie Tales, or just this, the chronology of this, the distribution. Yeah. So you, you made it. It's a VHS, right? Yes, yeah, a VHS. Mm -hmm. Yes, a yes. So and how did you figure out? You're like, uh, we have this. So, so we took out ads in Christian parenting magazines to announce that we had this show. And so, uh, what, what was interesting is we'd have, you know, uh, you know, the workstation set up in a telephone right here. And so, uh, whoever was happening to be animating at the time, the phone would ring. They'd pick it up. Hi, I'd like to. I said this ad for take this order. Take take an order, and then you know, we'd we'd bank all the orders. Um, and then when we got done with the show, we shipped them out. The cri Christmas just before Christmas of 1993 is when we shipped everything out. Um, so we got about 500 orders wow, uh, at $15 a piece. So yeah. if you do the math, that doesn't quite <laughs> cover that $60,000. It didn't, 000, quite, yeah. <laughs> it didn't <laughs> it quite cover that. that. But what it did was it got the interest of um, an executive here in Nashville. We were up in Chicago at the time. Uh -huh. um, uh, an executive up in, down here in Nashville, uh, Word Records was starting a new children's imprint called Everland Entertainment. And this exec saw our ad and was intrigued, ordered a copy and loved the show. Oh. And so then uh, by, you know, by that next year, uh, 1994, we had a distribution deal with Word, um, okay. you know, for, for our VHS tapes. And they were distributed directly to Christian bookstores at that point. Is it still like each person has to order it somehow? Or it, it's on, it's, uh, you can find it. Streaming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, so, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, now. So, you know, for years, you know, we started off on VHS, uh, available only at Christian bookstores, and then around 97, 98, that went, it went wide. We we developed a relationship with Lyric, who is the creator of Barney, uh, and they brought us through their distribution network into, you know, Walmart, Target, Blockbuster, all of that around 97, 98. So that's when it exploded. Um, just you know, DVD direct to video for many years, but then you know migrated over to, to streaming and yeah. did a did a series with Netflix a number of years ago called Veggie Tales in the House, which is available on Netflix. And then a lot of our direct to videos now are available on various streaming services. Yeah, you do it like yeah. that. So as the creator, I mean, you don't have to answer this question, but like, do you still get money and checks from any of it? Oh, or did so, you sell the whole like how? Well, it's a very it's it, it's sort of a tragic tale, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> oh, no. a tragic Veggie. Tale. Just as the writer, <laughs> right? You create it, yeah. Yeah, so, so, well, so what happens, Phil and I created the, the show, and uh, but we went through a big reorganization in the early 2000s um, okay. and went through a big bankruptcy, and we actually lost control of, oh, of everything. <laughs> I know, it's tragic. But but actually, it was, you know, for me, I, I stayed on as an employee of the new organization um, that then moved down to okay. Nashville. We were bought by a New York company called Classic Media, which also owned, like, Lassie and, you know, Lone Ranger and a lot of those kind of okay. properties. Okay. Uh, but we kept doing what we were doing. We, we reorganized the way we did our business. We were more of a creative house. We In, in Chicago, we had a, a big animation studio, over 200 people, and it was, it was a big operation. But we moved down to more of a creative kind of hub and then started outsourcing our animation. So our, our business model changed, changed. slightly, but okay. we were able to you know, keep, keep making shows right. up until 2016. Okay, so let's get into the writing process because that's what a lot of our audience wants to hear about. Yeah. Um, did you study screenwriting and or creative writing? What did you study? So um, writing, I, I you know, with puppetry and all that, it was still a lot of sketch writing, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and then um, when we first started Veggie Tales, I wrote uh, all the silly songs. And so um, you know, started with you know, water, well, Phil did the Water Buffalo song, but I did uh, the Hairbrush song and Dance of the Cucumber and you know all those songs. So yeah. so I was sort of the silly song guy. Um, and my very first, so, but, but the, the, the episodes were, were fairly short, and so they didn't need a whole, whole lot of, you know, a whole lot of structure. Mm -hmm. um, but once we started to expand kind of the scope of the, of the episodes, it's like, okay, we got to learn more about screenwriting now. And mm -hmm. so, so I went and I took my first screenwriting class in 1994. Five at the University of Chicago it was okay. an extension program, um, uh, adult extension program. Were and you done with your pre med classes at that point? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah, yes. Yeah. So you went yeah. back and said, "Hey, yeah, I should actually learn." Yeah, yeah, I should learn screenwriting, <laughs> and so this. you know, bought the final draft. Oh, um, nice. This was just when um, 
uh, Vogler's Writer's Journey came out. Ooh. So it was first edition of Writer's <laughs> Journey. You know, so that was our that was our, our, our text for our screenwriting class. Okay. And I had an idea for a show uh, because I double majored in history and, and I, I read a Flaubert's Madame Bovary in a, in a French history class Whoa. and reimagined that as a VeggieTales episode. And, you just and elevated happy, yeah, yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ha yeah, so so with a, with a happier ending, because of course in uh, Madame Bovary, she you know yeah. ends in suicide. But it's like, what happens if she is grateful and thankful for the things around her? So oh. I thought Madame Blueberry would be a great name for a show. And mm -hmm. so I went into the screenwriting class with that I with that idea, that idea and huh? actually wrote that episode uh, as an assignment in the screenwriting class. And then we, we were able really? to produce it right after that. Wow. Yeah. So was that the first like professional script you wrote? Would that was for Veggie? Was that what you would consider that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the silly songs themselves were kind of little plays in and of themselves, but they were you know shorter. Mm -hmm. But you know, just in terms of you you know, having to have this, you know, a structure in place, you know, to be able to support, you know, a half hour, you know, yeah. story. Yeah, that was that's, the first. That's that, where that it was, became. Yeah, like, for me, that was. I need. Exactly. And, and we were kind of growing the shows at that point. They were, they, they started off as, you know, there would be w one little show, a silly song, and then another little episode. But w eventually we started making them longer episodes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then by the time we got to, um, uh, I remember when I wrote Esther, which was another VeggieTales episode, the story of Esther from the Bible, mm -hmm. we wanted to kind of make it more cinematic, so make it a little bit more complex. Um, and then um, we were we were kind of building up to do a movie, which was Jonah, which was our first uh, movie, which we started off actually writing Jonah as a direct-to-video, but then we thought, wow, this could actually, uh, the structure of the story could support a feature film, so that's what launched us into our first film. So thinking about your writing process, I guess I'm interested to know, uh, do you outline and has anything changed over the years? Have you like learned something you're like, you know, I used to do it this way, but I've figured out this is the better way to do it. Oh yeah, I'm much more of an outliner now. now yeah, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. I think at the beginning, you know, you, you just get excited with an idea, and it's like, okay, I want the characters to start talking to each other. Yeah. And then, and then they start talking, they start talking, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, then outlines you're, can you're, feel very boring. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, um, so it's exciting that way. But I've noticed over the years, yeah, if I if I can create kind of a thirty thousand foot view of mm -hmm. okay, this happens and this happens and this happens, and right. then switch to, okay, now I'm in the space of the characters and, you know, I need them to talk to each other in a moat and, oh, where, by the way, where do I need to get? Oh, go over and look at my outline, you know, and that really keeps me on the rails, so. So, curious, writing for animation versus writing for live action, is there yeah. anything different about that? Like if somebody in the audience was yeah. like, I want to write for animation instead, anything they should know? You know, it's it's very much the same okay. um, in a lot of ways. You know, you know, obviously, with animation, you have to create your whole world anyway. So um, a lot of times, you can be more fantastic, mm -hmm. fantastical in there, right? Um, because it's going to be expensive no matter how you look at it. But not necessarily, you know, a, a, a real world scenario wouldn't necessarily be you know more expensive than something no. in space or under and the water. It might get really tricky to describe it, right? Or some of the description lines a little long because yeah, it's yeah, it's not it, just life. It's like it, yeah, yeah, and you can't, it can't, it, you, you can get descript, yeah, you can get overly descriptive overly, in it too. Yeah. Um, I noticed like when I write, you know, because kind of the adage is a, a page per minute, um, but uh, in a lot of animation scripts it's it, it's more, it feels more like two, two and a half pages per minute So um, uh, for, for a lot of scripts. So, um, but it's very much the same. The, the process of production is different in that, you know, with, with live action, you know, you, you, you finish your script, you shoot your script and then you go into editorial and then you know you you, you finish your movie um, with animation you finish your script, then you storyboard your script, and then you see that your story isn't working as well as you thought it would, and then you rewrite certain things and re-storyboard. Mm -hmm. and, and so by the time um, you start production in animation, you figured out your story and you locked it down, so you're editing first, um, mm -hmm. and then and then you're animating. So, so the storyboarding process, I think, um, it, in my opinion, it's why most animated movies are actually pretty good movies mm -hmm. because um, you haven't made your film before you figure it out if it stinks or not. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like you figure that out in storyboarding phase and you fix you most of the bad things before right. you go into animation. Yeah. Is there something specific in the development process when you're working with another creative type? 
and um, you were like, I want to collaborate with you. Yeah, you know, I uh, I've worked in different types of scenarios with you know both in you know kind of the feature model where you're you're kind of working alone most of the time, and, you know, getting something together and then you know getting feedback from that, um, mm -hmm. and then in that scenario, it's just I found it's just. It's just great to have people in a, a group of people that you trust mm -hmm. you, and, and that they know what they're doing, that they can speak truthfully to you about your work mm -hmm. and can help you make it better yeah. uh, rather than just make it different, you know. Sure. Um, um, and then, um, yeah, and then, and then, you know, like a standard writer's room where you're working with a, a group of people to, to kind of break stories and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just, I, just working with people. Do you like people. that? Is that more fun? Than I, you know, I can do that. I, I tend to be more of an introvert, and I tend to think better when I write uh -huh. than when I talk. Yeah. Uh, so I've had to learn the skill of being in a room and, room and, and, and push, push, pushing ideas around. And I kind of right. have to think for my think to myself, well, um, okay, I've this is this is work for me to do this. And I'm going to be able to sit down later and and figure it out as I write. But um, but yeah. kind of opening up myself more to be able to take in that and I can see how that could be yeah a little difficult. For some people, at least. Right, right. Yeah, I for think me. for <laughs> yeah. Well, particularly yeah. If you're if you're more introverted, I think that is, mm -hmm. and more. And some people just you know they they thrive off of that verbal back and forth, mm -hmm. you know. But that's that's a little tougher for me to do. All right. So outside of the Veggie Tales franchise, have you written any other projects? Well, yeah, yeah. So there was a, another uh, series that we did called Three Two One Penguins. Okay, it was another yeah. animated series. So mm -hmm. I helped develop that and wrote the first okay. four episodes of okay. that. So that cool. was fun. And then um, I did a little bit of work on a sh uh, HBO Kids show called Esme and Roy. Okay. Um, so that was a kind of a Sesame Workshop um, uh, project. So I, I did that. And then, of course, now with my own show, uh, yes. my own uh, book series, The Dead Sea Squirrels, which is right behind you. Yes. Kind of. it's yes. So cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah, so we're um, now, uh, yeah, we're developing that or that we're animating that right now. As usual, the, our audience members are raring to go to ask you some questions. So let's um, let them come up. How's it going? It's nice to meet you. Um, so I was sitting here thinking when you're writing for animation, you know, we don't really have to work with an actor who has their own idea of how they should do the script or act out a certain thing. So you have full control. Does that change the way you write action description? Uh, not really. I mean, it's still kind of taboo to, you know, direct from the script in animation as well. Maybe there's a little bit more of that happening specifically in, um, you know, w when you're when you're describing locations, just to sort of paint a picture. But you still, with animation, you work with other artists who are still going to add their artistry to to the you know to the piece, including voiceover actors and animators. Because you know, when you're talking about a uh, the job of actor um, in animation, it's split between the voiceover actor and and the animator mm -hmm. themselves, and so they're going to create the performance that's going to sell you know sell the line. So so in many ways, it is like working. Uh, with a with a live action actor, so you want to give them enough room to be able to interpret the script their way um, mm -hmm. and get that authentic performance out of them. Are you able to do a lot more with your action description, though? Are you are you able to do much more kind of spontaneous things out of nowhere in the script? Yeah, yeah. You just in terms of the 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 style of mm -hmm. like random things happening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if it, well, it kind of depends on the world that you're trying to paint, you know, because you can have an animated film that's very much, you know, like following the rules of the w real world, or you can just have a, you know, totally whacked out cartoon world. Mm -hmm. um, and when you when you have that, and you're trying to describe, you know, kind of that flow of action of, you know, stuff happening, yeah, you definitely want to, you know, you want to include all that in your all that in your script. Mm -hmm. But um, like when you're when you're painting a scene, uh, just like you would in live action, uh, you know, just general description um, will then leave a production designer or an art director room to interpret that and then okay. hopefully come up with you know, something better than you thought. A lot of times um, when I know I'll be directing something, you know, I'll I can kind of write to direct my, myself, but I, other than that, mm -hmm. I try to I try to leave that a little room for a little bit more interpretation for others right. downstream. Okay, cool. I have a better understanding now. Great, sure. that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So we're out of time, but thank you, Mike, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and talk with us. You have a standing invitation to come back anytime. Thank you so much, Irish. It's a pleasure to be here. Page to Screen is sponsored by the Tennessee Screenwriting Association. 
To find out more about the TSA, including our meeting schedule, or to become a member, visit us online at www.10screen.com. For the most up-to-date info on page-to-screen episodes, air dates, and guests, check us out on Facebook and on Instagram. I'm Irish Johnston. Thanks for watching Page to Screen. And remember, keep on writing and keep on learning. Thank you.